Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, what I've done um, this afternoon is I've divided the talk into sort of two halves so that you don't have to listen to me for a whole hour, me droning on. So halfway through, what I'd like to do is just have a session for questions and I will answer your questions as best as I can. If I say anything and you want clarification as I'm going, just, just let me know immediately. Put your hand up, let me know, and I'll try and answer your questions as I say as best I can. Um, I have to say, as a behaviourist, I haven't got all the answers to all behavioural problems any more than someone in medicine can end everybody's broken leg. But with a good deal of work, we can make things better for a lot of the, the lives of our parents. So the first part of my talk is to do with, um, I want to introduce a bit of information about parrots in the wild and the behaviours that they are adapted to do in the wild. And then in the second half, we come on to behavioural issues and how we can work better with our birds to prevent behavioural problems and hopefully to cure any problems that, that we've already got with them. What I can't do in a session like this is I can't do an individual counselling session. When I go and see people about their behavioural, about parrots with their behavioural problems, it takes me several hours on, on a home visit to work through the details of the problem. But I can answer general points about um, how we can improve lives of our birds even if, you're, even if you're asking me specific questions, but I can't go into long details. So I hope you, you know, it's okay with you. For most of my life as a child and as a young adult growing up, I was, I was just used to parrots as things in cages, a little bigger than a shopping trolley, really. Um, but of course, that is not what they are adapted to. And the quote on screen comes from, it's quite an old book now, but um, many of you, um, you may remember Tony Sofa as the producer of BBC programmes many years ago, and he did a whole series um, a long time ago on parrots. And this is a quote from John Sparks and Tony Sofa's, um, emphasising the fact that parrots are fundamentally flying creatures. They, the environments they live in are vast, and the distances that they can cover are huge. So when they become uh, companion pet animals, they have a lot of challenges um, to cope with. So just a look at a brief look at um, parrot biology, bird biology in general, really, but um, parrot biology um, more specifically. Not only are they hyperactive and sort of flying creatures, they are able to cover huge areas of territory in searching for food. I timed one of my birds, a Timnay Gray, while he was flying. He does between 40 and 45 miles an hour, just in sort of casual commuting flight, as it, as it, as it were. So if that bird were here, he could fly to Slough or Reading in less than an hour and then come back here to roost. And it makes you realise the vast distance that they can cover and the, the relatively little energy they're consuming in doing that, that they have access to a huge range of foods over this vast habitat. But they do have a very hyped up metabolic rate. They are not like us, they are not like mammals. They have a body temperature about 41 to 43 degrees C. Now, if you had a body temperature 43 degrees C, you, you'd soon be dead. It's, it's not something you would survive with for very long. But this is perfectly normal for birds. The heart rate of some of the birds, when they're, when they're in flight, in flapping flight, and trying to gain height, can be around 1,000 beats per minute. And our resting heart rate, heartbeat rate is about 68, 70 beats per minute. They do have something in common with us, and that's big brains. And anyone who's owned a parrot for more than a year or two will certainly know that they've got very big brains. I'm saying big brains in proportion to their body size. It's a similar proportion to primates and humans. So it's about 9% body weight. The other thing that each species has is it has a highly developed um, language of calls and postures. And although there is a lot in common, say, between a Senegal and an African grey, um, or a Jardins or something, there are also big differences because some of these species have been separated ecologically for millions of years. So cockatoos do a lot of things that African greys don't do. Par parrots from South America, the macaws and the conyers do a lot of things that cockatoos don't do. They have different body languages, but they do have a lot in common. And they use <coughs> this language to communicate with each other their reactions to things going on around them. And the reason why they do that is because parrots are social animals and they make collective decisions. In the wild, they aren't forced to make individual decisions. The whole flock will decide we're going to land in this tree or we're not going to land in this tree. One bird might see a snake or a human and think, 
that kills us, we'll go somewhere else. It communicates that behaviour, it, it communicates that alarm to the rest of its flock, and the flock behave as, as one in trying to survive each day of their lives. The other thing that parrots have is much better colour vision than, than we have. Um, we can see three colours, red, green and blue, and all sorts of combinations of them, and that's it, that's all we see. Parrots see ultraviolet light as well. Most daytime birds see ultraviolet light, and they see it as a separate colour. It is not related to the red, green, and blue that we see. Some parrots under ultraviolet light can be sexed. You can sex um, blue-fronted Amazons under ultraviolet light with nearly 100% uh, accuracy. You don't have to do blood tests on them. Um, so they have these different senses um, to which they are highly attuned. <coughs> um, sorry, yeah? Yes, you'll be looking for the difference in colouring of feathers around the forehead, the cheeks, and on the bend of the wing, on the wrist joint. And these show up as brighter colours in the males than in the females. Um, so, the Spanish, I can't remember who it was, the Spanish lady who did the research on that. It's uh, quite groundbreaking. I suspect that African greys to each other are a rider colour, not just on the tail, but over, over the whole body. And it just requires somebody to do do more, more research work on birds that we think, where we think the sexes look identical. So I'm sure, I know to birds, they're not. You know, just as we can tell males and females of our own species at 100 yards or more, so can, um, so can parrots. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to explain a little bit about how parrots are produced for the pet trade. Many years ago, um, in my learning curve days, well I'm still learning, but the curve was a lot steeper then, um, I used to breed birds. I used to breed um, Timnay Greys and um, Blue Fronted Amazons. Um, and over the years, I realised that I was just producing more parrots, and there were too many parrots out there, and not enough good parrot keepers. So it's like a lot of things. There are so many dogs out there, dogs that are destroyed every year, horses that are destroyed every year by people who just they can't cope with them. So they go to rescue situations, or the RSPCA. If they can't rehome them within a few weeks or months, then a lot of them have to be destroyed. We haven't got to that stage yet with parrots, but there are still more parrots out there than there are really good homes um, for them. So I want to explain a little bit about how, how parrots are produced for us now, these days. When I started out, it was still legal to import um, wild-caught birds, from, mainly from Africa and South America and Indonesia. That importation has, has uh, ceased, that ceased in 2007. Um, there may still be illegal imports of CITES-1 and protected species, um, but I, I, think that, I think that would be very small <coughs> numbers coming in. And there's no point in importing commoner species um, because they, they breed so freely in captivity. Parrots are raised and bred under um, a range of conditions. Um, some of the worst ones I've come across was a sewing machine factory in Birmingham it was a room about this size. This was reported to me under the Pet Animals Act. It's a room about this size. Down the centre of the room, there were rows of cages with blue-fronted Amazons and orange-winged Amazons in. And on either side of them, there was a band of, of people working at sewing machines on minimum wage. And they lived, the parrots and the people lived in this environment. Then these parrots are sold onto pet shops. So this is a more sort of commercial end of parrot production. Um, there's no pet shop license involved when the birds are sold on, there's no guarantee with them. At the other, nicer, kinder end, you've got um, like hobby breeders who are dedicated to the welfare of their birds. They will breed in much smaller situations, give the birds individual care, and you'll, you'll get a much, a much happier bird as a result. Now, once the birds are... Um, <coughs> Once the eggs have hatched out, the breeder has to decide, well, am I going to hand rear these birds, or am I going to let the parents rear them, and at what stage are the parents going to rear them? The thing about birds is, and this may happen to some mammals, is that the first thing that a lot of baby birds see when their eyes open, when they're only a few days or a few weeks old, they think that that is what they are. And this process is called imprinting. It's a, it's a delayed, the full effects of imprinting are delayed. If the first thing that person sees when its eyes open is the human face and the human hand, and that's all it sees for the following few days or a week, the chances are that most of those birds will imprint on humans and human hands. 
the effects of handprinting don't show up initially. It's lodged in the bird's brain, and when the bird becomes sexually mature, it then thinks, right, I've got to find a human who I think is of the opposite sex to me, and I want to mate with it, and I will do all my courtship behaviours to it. So I have a mayor's parrot who has done this to me for the best part of 18 years. He was given to me as, um, he was hand-reared, age, age unknown. I kn well, I know he's more than 23 years old now, and he tries to mate on my hand, and he's very cuddly, very friendly, but quite aggressive if someone else approaches me while he's performing these behaviours, which he would do in the wild um, if he was trying to um, mate with, a, obviously, a bird of his own species. The sexual imprinting is, it is a little more flexible in parrots than it is with ducks, geese, chickens, or whatever. So you can modify some of these behaviours, and we'll talk a bit about that later on. But it, the sexual urge in them is extremely strong and, and very long-lasting. The baby birds may be fed a variety of ways. At the worst end, in commercial breeding, some of them are just crop-fed, so a tube is, is put into their mouths. Food is pumped in, the bird has no choice as to how much food it ingests, the breeder decides that, or whatever. Alternatively, they may be syringe-fed. The bird um, on the right here is an African grey being syringe-fed. So the bird has some choice over how much food it, it swallows. Um, most people uh, would use um, like a, a bent spoon to, to hand feed baby birds. So as soon as the bird's had enough, it, it tells you by its behaviour that, that it's had enough. Some birds, like the, the two African greys on the left, they might be kept with their brothers and sisters. And the imprinting process, even though they're being hand reared, might not be so strong with them. They, they, they might have some realisation as adults that they are actually parrots. And they tend to be easier to keep if they aren't, if they don't end up with these, these so-called one-person birds. The other thing that happens, and, and I can't really believe that people are still doing this, I thought we'd won the wing clipping argument a decade ago. But a lot of baby birds are, um, are they're, they're wing clipped um, as fledglings, lit, really. So they've never properly flown, and they've already been uh, flight deprived um, in the pet shop or by the breeder. So this is just a summary. I hope you can all see um, of the conditions that birds are raised in naturally in the wild on the left-hand side, and the conditions that we would like them to show or to live in and to show. Um, as birds in the home. So for millions of years, parrots have lived, obviously, outdoors in all weathers. Whatever the weather throws at them, they cope with that, and that's how they live. Indoors, there is no wind indoors. So a bird doesn't know, even know which way to turn before it takes off. All birds take off into the wind. If they, if they feel the wind, they take off. When a bird feels wind, that gives it free lift. It makes flying very efficient to take off uh, into, into the wind, just as an aircraft has to do on the runways. A parrot in the wild, with very few exceptions, are highly social creatures. They're never on their own. They often find it more important to be with another bird than to find food if they get lost. The first thing they want to do is start screaming and calling to find another bird of their own species or similar species <coughs> that they can fly with. In captivity, a lot of them have to cope with solitary confinement. We have us as substitute birds, obviously, so we can provide them with a lot of company. But it's no use providing them enough company with half an hour a day and thinking we've, we've done our bit. They're, they're more like children in terms of their need for company and socialisation. Especially baby birds. Baby birds should be with somebody more or less all the time until they're at least a year old. As I mentioned before, wild birds have no concept of confinement. They don't have a concept of ceilings and walls and floors and things. These, these things don't exist. If a bird has a problem with something in the wild, it just flies away. They really are escape artists. They're like other non-predatory animals, like horses or rabbits. If they have a problem and they don't like it, they just fly, they just run. In captivity, they can't. If they're faced with something in captivity which frightens them and they can't move away from it, that fear becomes very intense and that fear can cause severe behavioural problems and does to, to a lot of birds. I'll have to deal with some of those as well um, in my work. Obviously in the wild, parents are raised by their, the parents are raised by their own parents and in captivity, for the pet trade, they tend to be raised um, by humans. The key thing about the imprinting is that it relates to the development of the baby bird and when it's being removed from its parents. Obviously if the eggs are taken away, artificially incubated, and the only thing they ever see is other humans, then those birds are more likely to be 
fully human imprinted and more likely to become one person birds. If breeders would leave the, um, the baby birds with their adults until several days or preferably several weeks until after their eyes have opened, then that imprinting is likely not to exist, the human imprinting, or it'll be very weak. The parent birds, certainly when I was breeding the greys and the Amazons, talk to the eggs, and the eggs talk back, usually two to three days before they hatch. You'll hear the, the chicken and the egg calling, and the baby bird is calling. And we do know um, from a brilliant book by uh, Catherine Toff, I think it is, and his name's gone, I'll meet you later on, um, that birds are able to identify individuals vocally. So Amazon parrots can identify a particular Amazon in, in this flock by the call that it's making. It's the nearest we can come to assuming that they're, they're naming individuals. That's Bob over there, that's Sarah over there, that's Mary. This, this is what they do, this is why they have this flexible vocal repertoire, why they can imitate other sounds. Obviously parrots in the wild are treated as parrots, they aren't. Nobody tries to turn them into little human beings and, and is too anthropomorphic with them. Um, innately, um, they, have a learned <coughs> they have a learned fear of human beings, and this is taught. Most birds have a learned fear of predators, and, and we are predators to wild parrots. The bird in the picture is no longer with us. Um, this is Ollie. He was given to me, age unknown, um, I don't know, a long time ago now. Um, he'd been hand reared. Um, he was in a so-called rescue centre in Dorset somewhere, and he died of heart seizures. He had big deformities. He was self-plucked and had been self-plucking. The previous owner told me for more than 12 years, trying to cure self-plucking after birds been doing it 12 years is near to impossible. Um, but when things start to go wrong in terms of our relationship with birds, because we aren't fully aware of the limitations to the things they can become adapted to. These are the sort of problems that I, that I normally deal with. These are the most common problems. Um, and probably the commonest, which is fairly mild, is the one person bird effect due to the imprinting. A lot of self-harming. Some birds self-harm to the point of mutilating their own flesh, pulling their own toe, toes off, um, chest wounds, and that sort of thing. A lot of birds are fearful, and they're fearful of apparently um, innocuous things. Somebody walks in with a black carrier bag, birds never seen a black carrier bag before, freaks them out. Walks in with a baseball cap on, pair of sunglasses, sort of predator response, freaks them out. So you get you get exaggerated fear responses um, from a lot of birds that um, haven't socialised properly with humans. Aggressive biting is um, it's a lot easier to, to, to address than the self-harming issues, if, if they've been going on, the self-harming has been going on for a long time. Aggressive biting is a lot easier to sort out, and we'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, screaming, I have to say, nearly 100% of all parrots are noisy, it's just that some are more noisy than others. That's, that's what you get when you have a parrot. I know there are exceptions, and there's an African grey who hasn't done 50 decibels in 50 years, but in general, parrots are highly vocal animals, and they rely on their voice. Um, for a lot of their natural behaviours, and they, they duplicate those natural behaviours as best they can um, in captivity. And then, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of birds, as, as immature birds, before they learn to fly, are wing clipped. I want to explain a bit why wing clipping is so bad um, for parrots as opposed to other birds. The safest birds to wing clip are ones that can't fly properly, like pheasants or chickens or farmyard ducks. Those types of birds have a response to not being able to fly. Every year, most wild ducks shed all their flight feathers in one go, live on the water until they grow their new flight feathers. They, they don't have a problem with flightlessness. They are adapted to coping with it for a few weeks of the year. The other thing about parrots is the molting sequence. Um, and the molting sequence is what causes a lot of the problems of broken blood feathers um, in parrots. Most parrots, when they begin a flight feather molt, they will start with a central primary feather. There are 10 primary feathers that start with a, with a primary number feather five or six, and then they molt in both directions at the same time along this primary web. So the last feathers to be grown on the wing would be the outermost feather and the innermost primary here, and then they begin to molt the secondaries. Now you can see what would happen if you were to call these feathers short, 
and then of course you're clipping the bird and the first feather to grow down is going to be a central primary it's got no good feathers next to it um, to be able to give it protection while it's growing down if that bird flaps or falls on the ground or hits a hard object then chances are it's going to break that, that feather with the blood in its shaft the blood is in the shaft it's not in the blood vessel so the bleeding can be quite sort of profuse and it's difficult to cure um, I run, as you probably know, I run a feather bank, so if people give me feathers for free from moulted feathers from their birds, I supply vets with them for repairing uh, parrot's wings. And um, the moulting process, um, nobody's done a lot of work on this, but I can tell you that all the parrots I've had, the rate of growth of the feathers is about four millimetres a day, uh, regardless of the species, which explains why some birds like budgies and hares parrots come off in a few weeks. Um, but the large birds like the macaws and the Amazons take months to grow a feather. So it will take about six weeks to grow one primary feather down if it measures about 40 to 50 centimetres, um, 40 to 50 millimetres long. Okay, what I'd like to do, I think we'll stop there briefly. If you want to fire any questions at me, um, I will answer those as best we can, then we'll come and, and have a chat about um, sort of more behavioural issues with pet birds. Anything, any burning issues you want to, to ask me about? No? Yes? Say again? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can send feathers to me. On, uh, you get, um, I've got my email address on the, the person that slide on here. Um, send that to me, or just put my name into Google, Greg Lendell and the stuff will come up where you can send them to. I desperately need primary feathers from African greys, copper teals, and occasionally Indian ringneck parakeets. They'll, they'll be great, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I'll remind you, as Greg said at the beginning, he can't do specific consultations, so just general questions. <laughs> yeah. Bring the microphone back. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I've got an umbrella cockatoo. So. Really? I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> We basically moved to a new area, um, and the book that I've got that says you should clip him so he gets used to the area. And you told me it takes six weeks, but his ones have taken ages to grow back. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so not more yeah, yeah, well you, you should never clip a bird. Um, the whole point about all the equipment that bird comes with when it hatches out the egg and develops is it's all there for a good reason. Okay. What I would do if you've got a clipped bird and the clipped feathers are the little feather stumps are in relatively good condition. Mm -hmm. I would have an avian vet imp feathers back onto that so the bird can fly immediately. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just saw them then. Yeah, both yeah, wings done. Yeah. Before, it wasn't clips and it, and it, and it flies. But yeah. just, I've read this book that basically when you move to a new area, just for him to get used to the area, you should clip him because when, when we moved there, he wouldn't come off my shoulder, he wouldn't leave my sight or anything, because everything's like new to him. Right, okay. And, uh, so that's, you know. <laughs> okay, cockatoos on <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> you, you, you might get away with that for a while, um, but you, you can go on YouTube and see all the, the stuff that cockatoos do to people's faces when they're five, six, seven years old. And yeah. you, you've got to be really careful with that. It's, um, people end up in hospital having their face stitched up, and birds on shoulders. Where the bird's on your shoulder, you can't really you can't maintain eye contact with it. It's rather like if I was talking to you and you're something like this and I don't know what's going on behind me. You know, you need to maintain that. You need to be able to read the bird's body language and it needs to be able to, to read yours all the time if it's out of the cage and it's with you. That, that allows better communication between you and your bird. I completely, yeah. Okay. If you read normally, if he's in a huff, he won't go on my shoulder. You, you'll just know. Yeah. But sometimes you can put him on a shoulder and you just know that his temperament's like really cool. I yeah, know, yeah. Know, it's, it's up to you, obviously, what you do with your bird. Um, I'm just saying that between May and August, I get loads of calls. The other thing we, we get with shoulder birds is that, oh, I, I, did, I forgot the bird was on my shoulder. I was doing a hoovering or something. The doorbell rang. I went to the front door. Oh, hello, the bird's gone. It's just like that. Even the wing clip ones, two or three primaries, once two or three primaries grow on the feathers and there's a bit of a breeze growing, they can get a lift. Yeah. I thought, the chap from um, John Haywood, he, he told me, um, he said, most escaped birds that are flying are wing clipped, but the, the feathers have begun to grow back. People have a false sense of security, thinking that, um, that yeah, like you, they may have read somewhere to, to clip the bird's wings. 
so they keep the birds away, but it can still it can still gain height outdoors because obviously outdoors the wind is blowing and that's free lift. And it was a good, good demonstration there as the bird lifted its wings. It was, as you said, that central primary being the first feather to come yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. And you're a good bird, that's will sort it out for you. No, <laughs> yeah, maybe here. Okay. One, it's quite new to me, but the previous owners must have done quite well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like that position. Right. So, um, people, I've been told to do that because I don't like to um, move yeah. the camera. But he jumps. Okay. <laughs> and if he comes and lands, then he'll do his best to land on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's okay if they land on your shoulder, so you take, take the bird off immediately. That's, that's the natural place where they would land. It, it's, it's having the bird stay on there. That's the problem. Now, the way to, to try and overcome that that problem is you need to reward the behaviour that you want the bird to do. Okay, so you would ask to have the bird on your hand, maybe literally for a second. Then ask him to go down. Then reward him. Then over the coming hours, days, weeks, whatever, you just extend that period that the bird is on your hand before you give the reward. And you need to work at a pace that your bird is comfortable with. And all your behaviour work, and that's what you need to be able to do. You don't use any aggressive language or gestures when the bird does an unwanted behaviour. You just try and teach the new behaviours um, at a pace that you know your bird's happy with. So you just reward those desired behaviours. It does help, um, I'll put the microphone down to, to show this. But it does help, as you say, to have your hand tilted slightly, at least initially when you're teaching your bird this. So the, uh, your wrist is a bit higher than your elbow. They have a natural <coughs> tendency to go up to something rather than, than down to it. So that would certainly help, yeah. But you need to give, you need to give rewards, and it can be favorite food rewards or head scratches or whatever. But they have to be rewards, not, not given for free, okay? Okay, one more perhaps? Yep. Yeah. yeah. in love with Laurie. Um, how would you advise somebody else like myself who is second parent but yeah. doesn't always want to be kept? But perhaps what advice would you give me? Because um, I kind of just take a step back at the moment but I want to kind of reinforce a good relationship. Yeah. Um, but she's desperately in love with Laurie so I'm kind of... Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a tricky one, but it's also a very common one, the one person bird effect, which is probably due to the imprinting. Does the bird have a closed ring on its leg? No. And what, what bird did you say it was? A uh, Hans. A Hans? Yeah. yeah, okay, right. And how long have you had it? Oh, right, okay, oh, good, okay. You got the start of the bird's life, really, then. That's great. What you need to do, um, is the bird okay with you? Yeah. You can, comes on and off your hand, all right? Yeah. And does the bird fly to and from you okay? Yes, unless the bird's there and then just... Yeah, so when you're on your own, the bird's fine with you. Okay, right. What you need to do is to get your partners to do the same sort of training when you aren't there, when you haven't been around that bird for oh, at least half an hour or so. All reward-based training, rewarding the desired behaviours with a food reward or a head scratch or something. If the bird shows any aggression during the training, just turn your back on the bird and walk out of the room make sure that you and the bird are calm again and restart. What you, hopefully what you will end up with is that when you aren't there, your partner will be able to handle the bird a little better, but when you are present, that imprinting process is probably so strong that you're always going to get the aggression if there's a threesome there, as it were, if you see what I mean. Um, so try that and, as I say, do it slowly and carefully and make sure that when you're working with the bird, you're always calm. You always appear to be calm to the bird. They're not telepathic, they can't read your mind. It doesn't matter, you might be feeling a bit, you know, is it going to bite me, this sort of thing. But if your body language is calm and your movements are slow and deliberate and your words are encouraging, then you should see an improvement. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll move on. I'm going to talk a bit more about behaviour and how we can <coughs> modify um, pet birds' behaviours. The first thing I want to explain is that um, and this is really hard. There are two aspects to this. The one key thing is that an animal in captivity who is being managed by people, doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a rat or a horse, or, 
Its behavior is unlikely to change until the people caring for their behavior changes. The bird is not going to change its behavior on its own. It's going to have to be uh, trained to do things differently, to give up the unwanted behaviors and to do the behaviors you're trying to, to get it to do. And the other thing is, is this the use of punishment or um, the use of saying no or, or being quite aggressive with the bird, even just verbally aggressive, or putting the bird back in its cage, anything that the bird might perceive as negative following an unwanted behavior. That is going to make bold birds more aggressive and it's going to make nervous birds more nervous if you show them these, if you, if you exhibit aggressive behaviors. In the wild, they, they will be subjected to some aggression. They get aggression from some of their own species, and they get aggression from other species that are trying to eat them. And in the wild, 80% of baby birds are dead before they ever breed. It's just how they live in the wild. But we don't have to treat them like this. We don't have to treat them like this in captivity. We can be a lot more humane. So technically, the, this, this thing where you administer something nasty to a bird, even it's just a tap on the beak, or saying no, go away, or shouting at it. Technically, that's called positive punishment. And it has serious behavioural effects on, on most birds to, to whom it, it is applied. And there's, there's no need for it, really. But trying to get that over is, is quite hard. But, uh, there we go. All the birds' behaviours, all animals' behaviours, and you could almost say this about humans, they exist for these two reasons. All a bird is trying to do is trying to ensure that it's comfortable, psychologically comfortable, metabolically comfortable, comfortable in terms of its diet, trying to do that. And it's trying to avoid pain and discomfort and fear. That's all its behaviours are geared up to do. And birds have, for their size, relatively big brains and they have very long memories. And if people have done things to birds before you've got hold of them in their past life, they are going to remember those things for months, maybe years. And that has an effect on how they relate to people in their future lives and how they might relate to you. So it's important that all, all through the birds' lives, they are, they are treated well with people who understand at least the main principles of, of behaviour. Then there are two sort of aspects to addressing behavioural issues. There's the bird's general living conditions, the environment that you provide for it in which it lives, and then there's the more intimate sort of details of the relationship between you and the bird, how you, how you relate to each other. So I'm going to come on to those things um, now. Um, the birds in the picture, these are my birds, um, these are all so-called rescue birds. The bird on the left, Timnae Gray, this bird spent 17 years locked in a cage. And apart from a few feathers down here, he didn't self-pluck. A bird in the cage, never out, didn't self-pluck. A gray. It's incredible. These two, this one came from a uh, World Parrot Trust decades ago. I don't know, he's in his 40s, I think, now. This is Captain Flint. This is his mate. Um, and I've had, I've had her I think I've had her for 20 years, I can't remember, yeah, about 20 years now. Um, so th these are all birds that the owners have obviously you know, given up on. And if we can provide them with a more stimulating environment and get their, get their general environment improved and more interesting and perhaps even a little bit more challenging as it would be in the wild, they do fare a lot better. So they need daily opportunities to actually hunt out and forage for some of their food every day as they would in the wild. Birds in the wild would think nothing, and African Grey or Amazon would think nothing of flying 40 miles to a favourite fruit tree or fruit nut tree. They'd get there in an hour, so that's no problem. And then an hour later they might want to go somewhere else and have a different sort of um, food to eat, so they fly another hour and go somewhere else. They're covering huge distances. When they get to these foods, some of them are quite challenging. They have to suss out whether they're ripe or not, they have to work out if they can get into them, if they've got hard shells on that, or if they're soft and gooey and they can lap up as much of the liquid before it all drops to the ground. So they have this range of foods that most of the birds eat. And if we can provide different types of food, sometimes at different times of year for them in captivity, that adds environmental interest um, to them as well. If they can be out of their cages for long periods of time, they can fly, and they can forage for some of their food. If they can play with you, play with other birdie mates, that would be really good. And if they have infinite number of things to chew up to destruction, doesn't matter, they can chew up sort of feeding balls like this, you just hide bits of um, peanut butter or margarine or something in them. Or they can chew up the perches in the aviary that they're, that they're in and you replace them every few weeks. That's what they should be doing. They should be having their beaks doing something for much of the daytime. And those sort of things will help. The other thing I'll talk briefly about 
with a caged, with caged lone birds is the use of a roosting or a snooze box or area for them. A lot of birds do benefit from this, probably because almost all parrots are whole nesting species. Um, and they will get great comfort from being able to have another choice of type of environment to go into, especially if they're on their own for long periods. They might want to go into their snooze box in the afternoon when most of them will have a little bit of a siesta. Or if they're nervous, they can go in there and know that nothing, um, no harm will come to them. It can also help, in some cases, with the reduction in noise. Most birds don't go into a roosting snooze type box and spend hours in there screaming. They make little noises but the noise reduction um, can be quite significant if you use a roosting box um, for them. They should have access to that roosting box um, from within the cage, whether the box hangs outside the cage. And you can have other of these boxes around. <coughs> the disadvantage of them can be that some birds, probably males more than females, become more aggressive. So if you've already got an aggressive male, um, I wouldn't recommend this, but they still need to have plenty of things to, to chew up and um, chew up to destruction. Because, um, there's a huge range of downstairs of foraging toys, and you can buy really fancy big ones, uh, full full colour versions of all sorts of stuff, and swap them around occasionally so the birds get in different types of toys. When you're introducing new toys, don't just give the bird the toy. That'll freak it out, especially birds like greys and some of the cockatoos. You should introduce the toys slowly and carefully. You playing with them first. If the bird's liked you, and it sees you playing with the toy and pretending to eat food from it, it will replicate your behavior, especially if the bird's imprinted on you. So you need to show, how, show the bird what the toys are, that they're fun things to be with. And you would do this initially probably out of sight of the cage to start with and gradually introduce the new toys to the cage. But in addition to the made toys, you can make up your own homemade ones, um, anything made out of paper, cardboard, <coughs> pine cones, bits of wood to chew up, that sort of thing, um, laced with favorite foods, that, that's ideal. Okay, I've mentioned about um, avoiding punishment, so hopefully we're okay with that. Um, I want to talk briefly and, and introduce some, some sort of concepts that relate to the scientific work in terms of behaviour and behaviour modification. Because different, it, it's very hard if you go on the internet, and even with some of the, the older books, to work out what is good advice and what is bad. And the way to do this the way to dismiss the rubbish from the good is to know that the person who's written this understands the science of learning theory and the science of behaviour rather than just other people's opinions. And that's quite a tricky thing to do, but, but you can get there in most cases. So I'm going to introduce two terms, negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement, which some of you, I'm sure, you, if you've been to um, uh, David Wilcox's sessions, you'll, you'll be familiar with those already. Um, negative reinforcement. People do use negative reinforcement on parrots, and it's where you do something to the bird which it doesn't really like. It's not punishment because he hasn't done anything yet. The bird doesn't really like it, but he will try and overcome this thing you're doing to it. So you'll see some old videos on YouTube or stuff where you've got people chasing a bird around a room with a stick trying to get it to step on the stick. The bird doesn't like this. The human is chasing the bird. This is the wrong way around. Eventually, the bird gets exhausted and just sort of gives up. So it thinks, I can't cope with this anymore. I don't want to step on the stick, it frightens me. It looks horrible, but I'll step on it and see if this behavior stops. So the bird learns by trial and error that if it steps onto the moving stick, the stick stops moving and it can take a break. Okay, it's the same thing with Monty Roberts and horses. Chase the horse around a pen for a while, 25 minutes or so. Horse gives up, ah, I can't, can't cope with this, knackered, gives up, does whatever the, the trainer wants. That's negative reinforcement. It works, that's the problem with negative reinforcement. It works, it gets the bird to do what you want, but it can destroy the relationship you have with the bird because it's an aversive, aggressive behavior. So you don't want to be chasing a bird around, you want it to step onto a stick. You want the bird to be chasing you, you want the bird to be coming to you. This is where positive reinforcement comes in. So to do positive reinforcement, before you do any training, you need to know what you're going to reward your bird with, and you, come to, you want to make sure that whatever you choose for that reward is something the bird already likes. It's not something you're going to teach it to like. There's no point in offering a bird grapes if it hates grapes and wants a the harness. There's no point in offering a bird scratches on its head if it hates scratches or doesn't like you at the moment. You've got to find something your bird really likes and you use that as your reward. One of the things I do um, when I get um, 
something to do is a food test. Because some people say, oh, my bird, he's nothing but sunflowers or he really loves grapes. But sometimes the, the bird's likes and dislikes will change. It might change over a few weeks, even over a few days. So I do a few food tests. This is, um, this is red, one of my Timothy Grays. So you put four or five different foods available for him on a, on a food pot that he's already familiar with. And you put the bird down and you, you allow him to take one item. Then you remove the food pot. Five or 10 minutes later, you come back again. You replace the missing item. I think he's on, I think this is walnuts, he's on here. He's going for walnuts rather than almonds, rather than grape, rather than some parasite. And you repeat this test a few times, and you usually come out with a favourite food, so that each of the four or five times, the bird has always gone for the same thing. So then you remove that thing from the free food supply. He's got walnuts, or anything similar, peanuts, or almonds, or whatever in his food pot. Take all those nuts out, give him all the rest of his food at all the times. He's got, he's got access to other foods, that's not a problem. But the foods you're going to use for rewards have to be rewards, they have to be earned. So you use those in your training. Now, if you've got a companion bird in the home, it's, um, it's a bit like a sort of flying terrier dog sometimes, especially if you've got uh, Amazons or mares. Or a lot of people with like mares and Senegals think that before they get them, they think, oh, it's a small bird, that'll be easy. But they're like flying dynamos, aren't they? And they can be into something immediately. And they're sort of, they, they have more of the character of a terrier than, than like a hound type dog. They want to do something immediately, you've got to do it now, it's no use waiting two seconds, and things like that. And they're very hyperactive. And all birds have a tendency to do this, but, but some more than others. On the screen here, I've listed the key sorts of requests that I try and teach, get my you know, clients to teach their birds. And where, the, where these birds are in the house, this, is, this doesn't relate to avian birds, obviously, but this is a bird you want to relate to, you know, every day of your lives. So the first one, is asking the bird to step on and off your hand or on, or on a handheld stick. Again, you don't chase this bird around. If the bird has a history of being a bit of, of biting you, you might find it easier to use the stick. But before you ask the bird to go onto the stick, the bird's got to think, I like this stick. So initially, all you would do is show the bird the stick. It looks at the stick. What's that? If it looks at the stick, it gets one of your food, the favorite food reward. There's a bit of walnut or whatever it is. Lesson over, that's it, done, that's great. Come back an hour later, do the same thing. A lot of birds, after a few sessions of this, see the stick and think, fly me food, right. And after it, they're chasing the stick around. It really will. If the food rewards change and the bird suddenly likes almonds or grapes, you swap, you make sure you're always giving that reward to the bird. This reward effect is a bit like, in human terms, if someone said to you, I've got a job cleaning toilets out of something. Pound an hour, how does that sound? No, not interested, eh? 100 pound an hour? Yeah, my fair right? What we have to do is you have to find something that's equivalent to that sort of 100 pound an hour effect, as it were. That you'll do something you're a bit wary of the first time, and given the incentive, you will. If you give birds incentive to do the behaviours you want, they will try to do them. So, initially, with the getting the bird to step up onto a stick or onto the hand. As I say, it might not like doing this to start with, especially if it's been treated badly by previous owners. So the whole process is very slow, and the pace that you work at with your bird is determined by the bird, not by you. If you go too fast, you'll end up going backwards, you make the bird nervous. If you go too slow, you haven't sort of made the bird like thinking enough, as it were. So that comes down to your sort of skills um, in training. Yeah, sure, yeah. You did say we could butt it. Can I just say, from my own experience with very phobic African greys, who all seem phobic, a wooden stick they hate. A white plastic perch, which I bought as part of a stand years ago, white plastic perch, no problem. They make the Northern Paris make a little stand, which is a like a pirate's false arm with a stick, which, and that also is quite acceptable. But wooden sticks, they're terrified of. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's whatever the bird Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's whatever your bird likes. That, that's, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go, go with that. That's not a problem. Because they're all different. They've all had different experiences in the past of their likes and dislikes. The other request I try to get them to do is a stay request. Now, obviously, birds are flying creatures. But they haven't had their wings clipped. And once they start to like you or like a specific person, 
if you were to leave the room without looking at the bird, one of the nasty accidents that sometimes happens, this, and I get phone calls about this every year, is that as the door is closing, the bird gets caught in the door, and that can kill a bird or certainly break a limb. Um, so you need to know where the bird is as you leave a room. You sort of, I just automatically, with birds in the room, I back out of the room and look where they are, and I go out and close the door behind me. And it's just something you have to adapt to doing once you've got the birds in your house flying around. Um, so it's important to do that. To teach a stay request, I've got birds here, um, but the principles are the same as the earlier chapter that, that you saw talking from the um, power trainers. Um, that if you you teach this this request quite slowly and carefully, so a bird might fly towards you. Of course, it knows you're going to leave the room, and I just put one one or both hands up so that the bird can't land on me. They usually land on my hand or on my shoulder, and I'll just put my hand up and ask the bird to land somewhere else. When the bird lands somewhere else, you can just say, he's a very good bird. You might even give a little tiny bit of a reward or a little head scratch or something, nothing major, and you leave the room. After two or three sessions of this, um, the bird will learn that the gesture like this means, oh, I can't, I can't fly to him. Um, if he knows you're gonna be out of the room for like an hour or so, he's gonna be desperate to come to you. So when you're teaching this, come back into the room a minute or so later, don't stay out too long. Teach things gradually, and the birds will learn. I also try and teach birds to fly off my hand, um, on the cue, and all the cues are verbal, and I initially teach this with asking them to fly back to their own stand, or to their own cage, or to any perch that they're already familiar with. Initially, when I'm teaching this, I will put a reward on the perch that I wanted them to fly to, have the bird on my hand, and the, bird might, the reward and the bird might only be like a metre or so apart, a yard or so apart, and you aim the bird in the direction, you say, go, go, and tilt them in the direction, and they'll go and land on the reward, on the perch where the, where the reward is. Then you increase the distance um, from the place you want the bird to, to land on, <laughs> sunrise. And um, uh, so gradually over time, the bird should be able to ask the bird to um, leave your hand wherever you happen to be, as long as you and the bird are on the familiar ground. Then the other thing is asking the bird to fly to you. Asking a bird to fly to you requires from a bird that's certainly not human imprinted, requires a lot of commitment from that bird. Most of the perches that wild birds land on are fixed, they're cold, unless the wind's really blowing. They don't wobble around, they don't feel weird when they land on, on a perch. When a bird's on your hand, your hand is warm, the skin is wobbly and it moves, your whole hand can move. And when a bird's never done this, um, it, it's a big thing, it's a big commitment for a bird to launch its body into the air. Birds that are confident flyers will launch into the air and they, they're not looking for a particular perch to land. They're confident flying around. Birds that aren't confident will find a perch and think, okay, I'll go to that one. And they, they take ages sometimes to get sight on and then they fly straight to that perch. That's it, they don't fly around the room and have fun and shout and scream. But when they're confident, um, they do. So initially, when teaching a bird to fly to you, you might hold a reward. <coughs> you, might, you might hold a reward in one hand, and you have the bird is going to be between where it is and, and this other hand. So you might have a favourite food reward or an offer of a head scratch in one hand. The bird might only be two or three feet away, and it's always lower down. They, they, they prefer to fly up rather than flying down from my perch when you're teaching this and you ask the bird to fly to you, and on the first attempt that the bird flies, you give it the reward immediately, you put the bird down somewhere so it needs its reward, and you do that as, as quick as you can. And then, feet away, you just, you just increase the distance, um, and then gradually, hopefully, the bird will learn to fly to and then from you on a verbal cue. As you're doing the training, you, you haven't got to keep up with the rewards all the time. You fade, you fade them out slowly, and it might be over a period of days, or it might be over a period of weeks. It just depends how good you, you are and how, and the bird's history, and how, how, how able your bird is to learn things, and at what speed it can, it can be taught them. Um, but fly, getting a bird to fly to you can be one of the hardest things um, to do. The final request is, is an off request. Um, in the house, there are lots of dangerous places that birds can end up um, being on anything electrical, tops of doors that are left open can close on them, any cables that they might bite into um, can kill them very quickly. So you need a request that asks the bird to leave. There are two ways you can do this. You can ask the bird to fly to you and then put it down somewhere safe in its cage or away from any, any hazards, or you can ask it to leave that perch and fly to another perch by pointing at it. And then you do this with rewards. 
you hold the rewards or you put the rewards on the place where you want the bird to fly to and you give the cue. But as I say, the key thing with these rewards is they have to be rewards. They are only available during training sessions. If you're not doing training on that day, you can give them whatever food you like. But save your really valuable foods from the bird's point of view um, for those, those days when you're doing training. Okay, what about unwanted behaviours? Mm. This, this is all I deal with, really. When people are getting on with a bird, they don't make calls, you know, it's like a vet, you know, the, the animal's healthy, and uh, oh, we'll bother with the vet anyway, right? Yeah. So I, I, do, I, only, I only see problems um, when, when they get to, to be a bit serious. And parrots have got very powerful beaks. They're not like um, crows or blackbirds or stuff like that. Those sort of birds, they have, a, they have a fairly weak grip and they rip things apart by twisting. They've got very strong uh, neck muscles. Parrots, because they're, they're into crushing food in order to get at the human side, have got huge crushing strengths. Despite the size of the bird, you get a really painful bite off a Senegal or a Maid that you wouldn't get over a bird of the equivalent size like a starling, you just can't do it. And there's this crushing strength that is there, it's, it's vital to them, obviously it's part of their repertoire, repertoire to get at their foods. But it, it can be very powerful. And once it happens to someone, if a bird has access to the face and the bird bites the face, well, yeah, it might, you know. You might have a parrot on your shoulder, you might have done it for five years or ten years. But it's not going to surprise me if that person then phones me up and says, oh, we never did that before. I have to say, behaviours that behave, that happen for the first time, by definition, haven't formed the first time. A bird, when it's a baby bird, isn't going to behave like an adult bird. People will often get a bird that's like six months old, grey or an Amazon or something, and they think, they might think that that bird's going to be like that for the rest of its life. But a sexually mature, blue-fronted Amazon is not going to be the same as a 16-week-old baby. It's got a whole set of different behavioural um, needs and behavioural um, responses. So, the best thing to do with unwanted behaviours, don't appear to get have got hyped up about it. As best as you can, remain to appear to be calm, don't say anything, and try to leave the room. The leaving of the room thing, assuming the bird already generally likes you, but something's gone wrong, the leaving of the room, once the bird makes the connection with an unwanted behaviour and you left leaving it on its own, it should have the incentive to cease that unwanted behaviour. You've got to give the bird the motivation for doing or not doing the things you want it to do. The other big issue I get is the problem of unintended reinforcement of unwanted behaviours. So a bird is self-blocking or trying to tear its toenails off or something, and somebody, the owner, will look at the bird and say, stop that, don't do that, stop that. So they're, they're interacting with the bird while it's doing this behaviour. So the bird will take that as being rewarded. It's getting attention for doing something. The bird may also get intrinsic rewards as humans do from self-harming. And if that behaviour persists for several weeks or months, it's very hard to do anything about it. But if it's checked quickly, you've got more chance of um, recovering it and getting back to, to where you were. Um, all this you know, is in my good book, which I'm selling. So if you haven't already got one, um, do get a copy of my book. And I'm going to store on, on number 27, opposite um, the Parrots magazine stand. Um, this talk has been a sort of summary of my um, behaviour work in the book. I've spent a good part of my life working with birds and understanding them. I don't breed, I don't buy, I don't sell. <coughs> I just try to help clients who've got birds who might have some behavioural problems. This is just a summary of the things, a sort of checklist. Um, I won't go through those now. We'll try and leave you a few minutes for questions. That's okay, Alan. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Think back to some of the things we used to do in the 80s and 90s with massive importations of parrots and, and warehouse breeding of birds and taking baby birds away at day one to hand rearing into the pet market. It really horrifies me now when we look back at it. And we've only really begun to understand the psychological, mental, and physical needs of parrots in the last couple of decades. And Greg's work has gone a long way towards that. We do have a few minutes for a few questions, but the next session of the 
last session, the mini masterclass takes place in 15 minutes. So if you want to go to that as well, you have to leave shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I just wonder if you can teach any bird of any age, um, you can train this bird, but I've got a Seth Congrey who's 26 years old, so um, she doesn't fly to my hand, for instance. Would that be something I could do with the perseverance? Okay. Um, yeah, the, the question was about, can, regardless of bird's age, can you sort of teach it new things? Yes, you, you certainly can. It probably is a little harder with a bird of that age, because it's got a lot of things in its past. I mean, it hasn't got as long a future as something that's two years old or whatever. Um, but yeah, the, the behavioural principles of rewarding desired behaviours and removing yourself from when you see undesired behaviours work regardless of the, of the age of the bird. So I would persist with it and yeah, good luck with that. It should work. You should see an improvement, yeah. Okay, um, question was about um, trying to train a bird to do new, more pro-social things where trust has, has broken down with, one, with, your, with your partner and between your partner and yourself, or just with you and your bird. Okay, right. okay, sorry, right. okay. There is, no, there is no third party involved. Right, okay. What? Um. <laughs> All right. Yes, you, um, by the way, what is the bird to start with? What? Okay, and how old? Uh, he's coming up seven. And how long have you had him? Uh, well, nearly well, since January 2016. So. <coughs> oh, right, oh, not long. Okay, do you know his past? Um, History or? Yeah, I mean, he was um, <coughs> hand-reared, or rescue hand-reared, which is thing. He's got a clothes ring on? No, he's got a ring on. No ring, okay. So, he might be having a microchip diet So, his last um, exotic bird was actually in with a female and uh, right. that, and the male, although I think he'll be able to do certain things, but not yeah. things, which I appreciate George can do with my partner, but you know, with me, I, I can't even take him out, take him out here. Right, okay. Okay. Yes, I, I would work with the bird on your own, make sure there's no one else around, there hasn't been for some time, reward-based training. I would technically desensitise the bird to the stick, that will give you more confidence if you can get the bird to step onto a handheld stick. Um, just a stick about, I don't know, foot 15, 15 inches long. Initially show this to the bird, and when the bird looks at it, reward it. Don't let him touch the stick or anything to start with. And gradually get him to associate the stick with something nice that, that you give it. And it, that's the only time it gets those particular rewards for doing that behaviour. So you gradually get to the point where the bird approaches the stick um, and touches it with its beak or its foot. You gradually get to the point where it should step on and off the stick. And the first time that this bird steps on the perch, you immediately, within, within a second or two, ask it to go down and give it the reward. And lots of verbal encouragement and praise. A lot of birds go by the tone of your voice. It doesn't really matter what you say at this stage, you know, um, but it's the tone of your voice. And if during any of the inter interactions the bird shows excitement or aggression, just stop. Turn, you might even turn your back on the bird, stop everything for five or ten minutes and try a bit later. The key thing with, with working with animals is they learn fast in a calm environment where they have time to, to think about new things that are happening to them. Because, as I said, when you're doing this one-to-one, -one, this, this wouldn't happen in the wild. They'd have their whole flock mates with them and they'd be thinking, oh, I'm going to let Bob go and do that one. I'm not going there. I'm not going to drink from that. Well, let's see what happens to him. Okay. Then they'll all go it because it's safe. But they, they haven't got um, an equivalent behavioural system in captivity to do that. So it can take them initially longer to learn a new task. But once they make that association with a cue that you've given them, like step up and coming towards the stick and getting on and getting reward, once they make that association, the training thing is really easy. So those first few sessions are key. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one more last question. untamed cockatiels as well. The, I've, had him, I've had the tame one a, a month 
Um, and when he goes over to the other two in their cage, the one of the untamed ones, the grey, the normal grey, screams, and yet normally he's my quiet one, but he screams blue murder at, at the, the, the tame one. one. Yeah, yeah. The, the, tame one, the, the new tame one is just about a year and a half now. I believe um, he was hatched, I think, the 4th of February last year. Um, and I said I've just had him over a month. Okay. Tricky one, this. Um, I would need to know which of the birds may have been hungry and human imprinted, if any. I don't know. The, don't the, two, the two untamed, um, yeah. the, there's one, uh, a grey, uh, which is Spike, that's one that screams. He's normally quiet, and Smudge is quite um, interested in, in... The new bird is called Smudge? In, yeah. No, the new oh, bird is Gulliver. Right. Um, and he's, he's quite, Smudge is quite interested in him, but ah. the two untamed, Spike and Smudge, I don't know their history because I took them on from somebody else that was actually going to throw them out. Right. Um, and I say I've had them since, was it 2015? Okay, have, have you ever had all the birds out together flying around? I had the other day, yeah. managed to have, um, I was doing a uh, cage cleaner and Smudge came out sort of accidentally. So I've had Smudge and, and the new bird Gulliver out together, but not the, not Spike that screams at him. Oh, okay, right, okay. Hmm. <laughs> Can I, sorry, can I also add that um, the new Gulliver um, was picked previously by a vet from the lady that I got him because some sort of accident happened with a candle. So I, I believe, from what I understand, some wax got on him. And I don't know if the candle was lit or had been blown out and then okay. wax. So he's, he's clipped, but he does fly. He flies quite well, actually. Okay, well, that, that's good that, that yeah. he can fly that they, and that hopefully that they can all fly. Um, it's a bit difficult, this one. It, it's quite a complex one. Um, I don't think I can go into a lot of full details here. You need to have a good relationship with the new bird so that you can teach it flight requests, as I mentioned, so you're in control of it. Where you've got... Ladies and gentlemen, this is a reminder that the last mini masterclass of the day takes place at 4.15 upstairs. Last mini masterclass of the day, 4.15 upstairs. Thank you. Um, I'll just finish up. I just quick finish this um, Where was I? Yeah. So try and have as good a relationship with this bird as you can. Anyone who has got more than two cages in the same room, I would strongly advise all of you to make sure that the tops of those cages are protected with a plastic sheet or some sort of cover because you get really common injuries where one bird is flown onto the other, they might not be really aggressive, but they play a bit rough and one bites the other's toes. If you've got two or more cages in a room, all of those cages should have the top covered so no bird can bite another one from between the bars. I think I've got it. Thank you very much, folks. And thank you very much.